ASEAN People Speaks. Today is actually our very first or our pilot episode, so I'm very excited to welcome all of you in our podcast for today. I am Regine Jessica Buell, your host for this podcast. For our very first episode, we will be introducing the Working Group for an ASEAN Human Rights Mechanism. I know we're all very excited about this, and uh, we are also thrilled to have with us our guest for today. So to give us the context in which this podcast actually started and how the Working Group for an ASEAN Human Rights Mechanism is actually working right now and how, how it all came to be. I'm so glad, actually, that we are joined by our very renowned and uh, um, I'm very honored to uh, to introduce to you our guest for tonight. He is Attorney Ray Paulo Santiago. He is currently the Secretary General of the Working Group for an ASEAN Human Rights Me- for the ASEAN Human Rights Mechanism. He is also the Executive Director of the Human Rights Center of the Ateneo de Manila University, which is in the Philippines. Um, Sir RP, or Attorney RP, as we fondly call him, is active in litigation cases involving vulnerable groups, particularly women, children, the urban poor, and peasants. Attorney RP was actually also a recipient of the Freedom Flame Award of the Frederick Noman Foundation in 2014 and the inaugural ASEAN People's Awards in 2015. So, wow. He is also a member of the Ateneo Law faculty um, since 2003, and he has been teaching since that time. The courses that he has taught until this day are constitutional law, human rights, international humanitarian law, and clinical legal education, among many other subjects. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome in our first or our pilot episode for the Working Group for an ASEAN Human Rights Mechanism podcast, Attorney R.P. Santiago. Yay! Hello, Sir R.P. Good evening. Hi, Red. Thank you. It's I'm nice glad to be to here. And thank you for hosting this ASEAN People Talks or ASEAN People's Talk series. Yeah, thank you, sir, also for your time. We're very glad that you could join us in this pilot episode. I know it might be a little bit of pressure for you since you're the first guest, but uh, I'm sure this will go very well because, you know, the working group by heart. Well, for everyone's um, uh, for everyone's uh, listening, may, uh, later on we will try to address the working group for an ASEAN human rights mechanism as working group later on so that you'll just get to, um, we, we don't have to to say the whole name it's, of the It's a uh, that, it's a Yes, I know. <laughs> it might be a little hard for us to um, keep up with the, with the, with the long, with the long uh, name of the institution, but yes, the working group. But um, maybe to start off, Sir RP, maybe um, you can give our listeners a bet uh, background. Can you can you briefly tell us um, how the working group started? Can you give us a little bit of um, introduction about the whole thing? The working group for an ASEAN human rights mechanism, or the working group, as you will mention later, Reg is an informal coalition of mm-hmm. like-minded individuals. These individuals, some of them are with government, some are with uh, the academy, some are human rights workers, activists, mm. defenders. They all came together on the issue of establishing an appropriate regional mechanism of human rights here in ASEAN. So that has been uh, the platform of coming together by these like-minded mm. individuals. Well, that's very nice. So, ever since I, I believe, sir. Um, so it started at around um, before two thousand, right? I think nineteen ninety-eight. Uh, it started um, actually around nineteen ninety-five in Formal. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, 
the background behind its uh, establishment is mm-hmm. that uh, the movers of this working group actually came from the Lawyers Association in Asia, in the Pacific, or Law Asia. In oh. Law Asia, okay. Law Asia, uh, that's uh, again an association of jurists, of uh, renowned and esteemed lawyers here in Asia mm-hmm. and the Pacific, and they wanted to uh, come up with a draft Pacific Charter that would mm-hmm. have a human rights mechanism for the whole Asia-Pacific. Mm-hmm. But sometime in 1993, uh, this was when uh, there was this World Conference on Human Rights in Vienna. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the, there was this uh, Vienna Declaration and Program of Action. And one of the recommendations of that uh, Vienna Declaration is mm-hmm. for different regions all over the world. Including ASEAN? Who, Particularly, well, ASEAN actually is, uh, in a way, is seen as a sub-region. Because okay. again, if we look mm. at the regions, it could be Asia Pacific or even just Asia, which okay. is actually the biggest um, region or even continent in the world. In the world, but, yes. But uh, we don't have a regional aggregation for the whole mm. Asia or Asia okay. Pacific. But yes. we have. Uh, regional ab- or sub-regional aggregations uh, mm-hmm. in Asia, you have in South Asia, for example, and here in Southeast Asia, we have the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Yes, so right yes. after the uh, World Conference, the foreign ministers of uh, the ASEAN member states all came together. This was sometime mm-hmm. in July in 1993. Mm-hmm. And in their annual meeting, one of the things they, that they committed to is to mm-hmm. consider establishing an appropriate regional mechanism of human rights for mm-hmm. Southeast Asia, for ASEAN. So, Particularly for Southeast Asia, yeah. Yeah, so that's where uh, the, the group from Law Asia picked it up. Mm-hmm. We were thinking, I see. you know, it's, it's quite ambitious to work something so grand for the whole Asia Pacific. So yes, might as well definitely grab this because opportunity. it's so big. Yeah. Yes, to focus on Southeast Asia. So that's why from 1993, this group in Farbali uh, started 1995 and more Farbali from then on, uh, 1996. And uh, the group started meeting with government officials of mm. ASEAN uh, since, again, since uh, 1996, actually. They started meeting the foreign ministers in 1996. Back then, sir, you were you were already probably active already. Yes, or... I was actively studying mm. back then. <laughs> oh, I thought you. I was. Uh, I was still in law school. Uh, I entered At law school time. in nineteen ninety seven. Yeah, so oh. I wasn't part of the group yet. But eventually, you became familiar with it when you joined your organization yes. now, which is the Ateneo Human Rights Center, correct? That's correct. Because Ateneo oh, Human nice. Rights Center is the secretariat of the working group. Mm. So I uh, was able to join until it today. sometime until today. in 2001. Until today. Mm. Oh, that's very nice. Well, thank you for walking us through that um, bit of history about the working group for an ASEAN human rights mechanism, Sir RP. I guess now we would like to ask you, since the time of its establishment, what have been, um, what are the goals or what have been um, the working group, um, what is its mission or vision for the past years since its establishment? At the time, what we wanted to do was convince ASEAN uh, mm-hmm. to, again, set up that appropriate regional mechanism on human rights. But when okay. you talk about a regional mechanism, a regional mechanism is so broad. It could yes, be so actually, many things. it is. It, it is. could be a committee, it could be a commission, mm-hmm. it could be a court. Mm-hmm. So uh, we had to define, we had mm-hmm. to convince ASEAN what this regional arrangement could be. Because if you look at different regions around the world, for example, if you look at uh, Europe, uh, with in the Council of Europe, you have this European Court of Human Rights. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, if you yes. look at the inter-American system, you also mm-hmm. have a similar court and there's also a commission uh, on human rights. So we were trying to convince ASEAN since 1996 uh, mm-hmm. to look into a good model for the nation. Right oh, now, okay. we have uh, two mechanisms actually. We have the mm-hmm. ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, mm-hmm. uh, and we also have the ASEAN Commission on the Promotion and Protection of the Rights of Women and Children. Women and Children, yeah. yeah so, so right now, the work of uh, this working group is trying to push for effective mechanisms. Mm. Uh, because we do know that as fledgling uh, mechanisms, it's still imperfect. There could yes. be a lot of improvement. So and it's still a work in progress, definitely. Oh, yes. Yeah. Definitely. But since since its establishment, and considering that you have uh, already mentioned these two two groups already, where do you think now um the working group is heading to, sir? I mean, um. Considering, of course, the the establishment of um, of the two groups that you have just mentioned a while ago. Other than that, um, as a regional entity recognized by the ASEAN, what are the activities now of the working group for the past decades, and um, that has helped, um, especially in human rights promotion and the protection of um, of its mandate. I think there are two main things that has to be emphasized here. Okay. One is that ASEAN itself is not a human rights organization. It mm-hmm. was established for political, security, and economic. Oh, okay. Needs. Okay. Okay, so uh, it has been a work in progress. And mm-hmm. in fact, that's why 1993 was quite monumental uh, mm-hmm. for ASEAN because before that, uh, human rights was not really within the language of ASEAN. In fact, even after 1993, it was very difficult. In fact, it oh, took oh, many years really? for, ASEAN, wow. uh, for, for ASEAN to be able to imbibe uh, human it's, rights. Um, but even, human uh, rights. Mm. Yes, but even up to now, uh, it's still a very much difficult work in progress. Yes. Uh, number two, Again, um, if you look at the different countries or member states within ASEAN, there are different types of governments within mm-hmm. ASEAN. So we have a monarchy, which is Brunei, Barusalam. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a military junta at the moment, which uh, happened in Myanmar. Yes. Uh, we have developing democracies. Okay. So in short, uh, the priority on human rights, since it is not a human rights organization, mm-hmm. um, the member states are still um, working on it as what you call the ASEAN way, the step-by-step building mm-hmm. block approach of ASEAN. So I it's see. really a very difficult uh, work in progress. You mm-hmm. have to change mindsets within governments. Yes. And uh, even up to now, it's been made a bit more challenging because of the COVID-19 pandemic situation. Although, yeah. uh, theoretically speaking, it's easy to have meetings all over the world at the moment. Because the of video conferences and um, That's correct. technology. yeah. But at the same time, everyone is so busy. Everyone has meetings left and right, activities left and right. Okay, so uh, it's really how to be able to convince and change mindsets now at this technological stage that we are at the moment. Well, given that, Sir RP, I, I would like to ask you then, um, I know that despite the challenges and the many things that you have to hurdle um i i do think i mean we we definitely you have already said a while ago that um the working group has also achieved a lot so maybe you could also just share to us some of the things that you have um done also and um 
in I guess the notable things that um, the working group for an ASEAN human rights mechanism have done aside from the whole changing the mindsets of different governments, especially political leaders from the different ASEAN countries. Okay. Has there think, ever... Uh, yes, uh, I'll, I'll mention two as well. Uh, mm -hmm. There are quite a number, but I'll just mention two. Mm -hmm. One is all these keeping uh, human rights within the reader of ASEAN. Mm -hmm. Because from 1993, uh, but like I mentioned before, the mindset of ASEAN and the member states was not really that open to human rights. Yeah, and they're... even many civil society organizations, the NGOs, they didn't have faith in ASEAN at the time. Mm. Uh, when we started this, many groups were actually questioning, why are you wasting time and resources trying to convince ASEAN to set up this mechanism? Mm -hmm. And uh, ASEAN was see seen as an old men's club, actually. Oh, really? And, really? Oh, yes, that's another because story. That's why mm -hmm. uh, people for, were as thinking a part that... Of our, yeah, Sorry, as part you of were the saying... Trivia, mm -hmm. you know, as part of the trivia, ASEAN was established in 1967, but yeah. it took 40 years before, before. ASEAN actually <laughs> came together in a treaty. ASEAN yes. was established by a declaration, mm -hmm. but the ASEAN Charter was only adopted 40 years after. 40 years after. Yes, yeah. and uh, that is the second point here. That mm. change in the mindset, uh, slowly, little by little, um, part of the change in the mindset is how do we make ASEAN more rules-based and accountable? And that was the big debate of the negotiators mm -hmm. of the ASEAN Charter then towards mm -hmm. the 30th anniversary of ASEAN. And uh, by having this human rights body uh, included in the Charter is a yeah. testament that there was an effort to change it from an ASEAN that was seen to be without any accountability. Because mm -hmm. again, under international law, one, a declaration is not binding. Yes, it's and a mere two, declaration. Yes. Since it is not binding, it is a political document. Mm -hmm. There is also no accountability mechanism in that. Mm -hmm. So that is, or that has changed uh, with the advent of the charter. And again, part wow. of that accountability me mechanism is showing that, uh, again, work in progress little by little. Member states of ASEAN are more open and ready mm -hmm. to be held accountable with certain principles that we declare in the Charter. One of which is human rights and fundamental mm, freedoms. Yeah. Oh, that's very nice, sir. I mean, it's I'm um, going through. I mean, you walking through all the challenges and now. Little by little, the progress that the working group has already made, I, I think it really does a significant um, contribution, not only for the for the ASEAN itself, but also also to us as um, as citizens and the members of this of this uh, wonderful community. That uh, the mindset is shifted now, not just from a perspective of something that's uh, not too important to something that is also very very much prioritized because we will we are already holding people accountable and um promoting certain rights i mean freedoms and rights of um of people now if i may ask sir this is actually quite a personal question already but um considering the many challenges and the difficulties that you have to face or had to face in the past what inspires you then to work in this um very beautiful um human rights uh, this uh, this working group for an ASEAN human rights mechanism well it's always the people that mm. are inspiring uh one, the people that uh, I work with uh, mm -hmm. through 
this journey, I've met a lot of, um, you know, I've met a lot of inspirational people who have been... For sure, definitely, yes. ...in uh, this course. But at the same time, you'll be meeting a lot of uh, people who were not that open-minded to start. Okay. But later on, you would find out that, uh, you know, you may have different ideas, you may have different, uh, you may look at things differently, but mm-hmm. certainly in terms of goals uh, for the country and for the region, um, you align. So it's nice to be able to discuss, dialogue, communicate, and have that open mind uh, to learn from each other. So that's the people that you work with. And uh, another, when we talk about the people, Mm -hmm. is again, the people who are the constituencies. Mm -hmm. Because in Southeast Asia, in Mm -hmm. ASEAN, uh, not not all countries actually are developed countries. In fact, the majority are developing countries. Mm -hmm. So the majority of the people are not that aware of their rights. So part Mm -hmm. of our privilege of being able to be educated and know uh, what our rights are, it also becomes a responsibility for many of us who are Mm -hmm. privileged enough to be able to do something to actually help out in uh, letting people realize and know that there is such a thing as human rights. Yes, yes. Really entitled to it. So the changing of mindset, again, is not only with government officials, government Mm -hmm. employees, uh, but definitely that movement or struggle should also come mm-hmm. from the people themselves. The people, yeah. Yes. So and it's I think a that's, symbiotic relationship. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, I think you could really be proud of. The 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 fact that you're able to empower people. It's I mean, it's not just about you know, having that mindset that leaders make changes. It's also people who make changes as well because they feel very much empowered because they're aware already of, of course, their rights and their freedoms. Um, could you share to us, sir, any memorable experiences of uh, people? You mentioned a while ago that um, you've also encountered different personalities already. Are there probably like one or two that you can think of now that you can share with us a meeting meeting some prominent people in ASEAN while you're while yeah. doing your work for the working group yeah well as uh, in the in the members of the working group for example uh, we have members um, who are you know who used to be uh, high-level government officials then mm-hmm. um, so at the time but you know you'll, you'll be walking with them in the streets uh, mm-hmm. in different wow. ASEAN cities as if they're local wow. people you know, but uh, wow. very influential people from where they come mm-hmm. from uh, some are even considered as you know rock stars of human rights yeah. in the <laughs> human system rights. Yes, yeah. uh, they have been uh, special rapporteurs, um, mm-hmm. independent experts in the UN, you know, very mm-hmm. well sought after people. But um, they're really down to earth and you learn a lot uh, from them. Uh, mm-hmm. and Makes you think that they're also human. <laughs> I mean, they oh, also... very much, very much, yeah. yes. And that so, you're able to 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 relate to them very much because they're very humble too. Correct. So that in itself is a good good memory and experience. Um, mm-hmm. uh, them being very lucky. Ah uh, yes, yes. Just like you, sir, because. For me, you're, I, I see you as a rock star too in human rights, but you're very low-key too. So, well, 
Thank you for that, sir. Now, I think I'd like to ask you now, how do you envision the working group now, maybe in three, five, or ten years from today, as um, somebody also who is advocating for human rights, not just in our country, but in ASEAN itself? Um, how do you see the working group in the next coming Are years? This- our vision of success actually is to be able to disband. Uh, oh, because if, really? If in, yes, because mm. uh, if uh, we're disbanded, it means that we don't. There's no need for what we do anymore. Oh, uh, that's really nice. What we're nice. trying to do, what we're trying to do, is to convince uh, ASEAN member states again to come up with um, a mechanism or mechanisms. Mm-hmm. And that actually happened in 2009 and 2010 with the establishment of uh, ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, mm-hmm. which is ICER, and the ASEAN Commission on the Promotion and Protection of the Rights of Women and Children, Women. which is ECWC. Yes. Mm-hmm. And at the time, we already had a soul-searching moment. Uh, really? You together yes. with the other... <laughs> Get, yeah, uh-huh. because the mechanisms are already there. Yeah. And that was our goal. Mm. So what more should we do? Uh, but uh, later on, we found out, and uh, even through friends within the government, that mm-hmm. uh, there was still a need to push for the enhancement and of these mm-hmm. mechanisms and to push for effective mechanisms. Because again, these are still uh, mechanisms that are far from what we see in other regions. In mm. fact, we don't have a, what you call a communications mechanism here or a complaints mm-hmm. mechanism within mm-hmm. ASEAN. So we're far from those um, mechanisms that can be seen in other regions that are able to address real human rights challenges uh, within their areas. So that's our vision in maybe five, ten years. Hopefully, that mm-hmm. uh, we're no longer working on this because that means that uh, we have been able to successfully uh, push establish. For the yes. yes. Uh... But if not, hopefully, younger people would join this cause. And mm, uh, I yes. think right now it's nice that uh, more and more younger people. Uh, Mm -hmm. more and more civil society groups are working on ASEAN and human rights issues, not necessarily as part of the working group, but it's a complementary approach Mm -hmm. uh, in pushing for human rights. And that's why I was telling, saying earlier that uh, you really need the support of the people who are the ones demanding and asking that their rights be respected. Yes. Oh, that's very nice, sir. I mean, I, I mean, that's a very good point that you you mentioned a while ago. That the goal is really to disband because, I mean, although it might not appear to be, um, as appealing or as positive as it is, it just means also that if it, if it, if it gets disbanded, then. Um, mechanisms are in place. I mean, I mean, everything also is being done in an effective way. Um, that's a that's a very good point that you mentioned. Thank you for that. Now, um, do you think just so we could also uh, um, segue this to the medium that we're doing now? Do you think that um, this uh, the goals or this kind of goal could be achieved? through this podcast or through other medium? The, um, from the I mean, what's your opinion? Of, what's your yeah, opinion from the title on, on that this... uh, we want with this podcast, we want mm-hmm. to have a medium for the different sectors of the yeah. ASEAN community to be able to voice out their concerns, their aspirations. Uh, we want this to be um, a medium to be able to amplify it the voices yes. and to promote dialogue to promote Definitely. understanding so that's why when we were thinking of this podcast uh one the concept of a podcast 
appeals to younger people nowadays. Yeah. And, uh, it's very accessible. <laughs> Yes, but you second, could actually as... just you, you could just actually just use it. Sorry, you could actually just access it anytime, anywhere, even if you're working out. So this Correct. is really very effective. Yeah. Correct. So it becomes an effective communication tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, but and that's the second. Uh, the second is we do need to be able to communicate, mm-hmm. and uh, part of the progress that we've had. Uh, from the change in the mindset little by little is mm-hmm. always brought about by communication, uh, dialogue, dialogue, and yeah. understanding. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so, so these nice. These are the things eh? that we would like to achieve here. That's nice. That's a, that's a, that's a nice. That's a very good vision for for the working group. And also for this uh, podcast too, and the other other episodes to come um maybe to break it a little if i may ask you if um i guess for our listeners right now um if you would describe uh, the working group sir uh, attorney rp is there a particular movie or a series or uh, that you have in mind to describe the working group for an asean human rights mechanism could you think of one right now, if you'd probably just compare it. Uh, that that's you know that's uh, it's a very challenging question. <laughs> what I can what I can think of actually is uh, the movie Braveheart. Oh yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Definitely. I love that movie. To contextualize it, yeah. Mm-hmm. To contextualize it, that movie is about a revolution. Yes, okay. yes. But again, it's dated. That's why I'm saying we need to contextualize it. Because mm-hmm. that kind of revolution, an armed revolution, an armed struggle, was needed at the time because you were dealing with medieval times. Yes. But we're now in modern times where we are governed by the rule of law, we're governed by uh, constitutions, by charters, we're more rules based. But the movement, in order to demand changes, um, mm-hmm. the battle cry there was freedom. Yes. I think that yes. battle cry still yes. resonates up to today. So up to today, mm-hmm. we want a lot of freedoms. Not yeah. that we want to, you know, not the kind of irresponsible freedoms. Yes. Uh, because of course, when we talk about freedom, uh, the reality is that there are limitations to certain freedoms. Yes, um, yes. Basic limitation is that your freedom should not injure someone else. Someone, yes, someone else's that, freedom. That's, uh, All right. Yes. yes there is, so, you know, someone actually always says that uh, I forget who said this, but uh, my freedom ends where the bridge of your nose begins. Because <laughs> if you start hitting that person. And you're already injuring someone else. Yeah. But again, when we talk about freedom, mm-hmm. uh, there are times when our freedom is curtailed. Yes. Okay? So the freedom could be as literal as being able to uh, speak our mind. So freedom of expression, freedom of opinion. It could be freedom from hardship. Like mm-hmm. uh, we want economic freedom. We want yes. to be able to be able to chart our destiny to work, freedom from yes. hunger. So mm-hmm. when you talk about freedom to be able to pursue your destiny, yes. freedom for you to pursue what kind of profession you would like to do, mm-hmm. freedom to be able to study. Okay? So yeah. freedom as well right now uh, with this pandemic, uh, we want good governance in order for us to be able to exercise more freedom outside, yes. even outside our homes. So for me, brave heart with that word shouting, freedom, freedom resonates yeah. a lot right now. And um, our freedoms, ideally, our freedoms should already be there. But the reality mm-hmm. is at times, we need to fight for these freedoms. Mm-hmm. So not necessarily, again, 
the fight that was being done in Braveheart. But mm-hmm. we need to yeah. fight for our freedoms within the bounds of law. And yeah. that's why being able to communicate, to dialogue, this is part of us exerting mm-hmm. and working towards our freedoms. Oh, that's very nice, sir. And then that, you know, I, I... I have a one short trivia, Reg. Yes, sure, uh, sir. Go ahead. To me. You I'd know, love when, to when hear we started, it. Yeah, but mm-hmm. when we started this initiative, mm-hmm. uh, our main partner, even up to now, mm-hmm. is a German foundation called uh, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh. And their battle cry as well, it just occurred to me now, that their bat- battle cry as well is freedom. Freedom! Yeah. Oh. Yes, because their full name, actually, for the foundation is Friedrich Naumann Foundation for mm-hmm. Freedom. For freedom, uh, because yeah. it it has uh, espoused these ideas, and yes. for us to be able to be free, uh, part of it really is the are the values of human rights. Yes, uh, yes. The uh, respect for human rights, the promotion and protection of human rights, and as well giving freedom to others. Yeah. Oh, that's very so nice, that, that's sir. One, Another That's trivia true. that I can think of at the moment. Yeah. And speaking of freedom, I guess also somebody who just popped into my mind is Maria Ressa, who actually just recently won the Nobel Peace Prize, right? For her freedom of Correct. expression. I mean, one of the people also that you know I look up to, aside from you, <laughs> um, it's, it's nice also. And um, I, I think I... Uh, I like that. I like that uh, you shared about, uh, I mean, relating Braveheart to the working group for an ASEAN human rights mechanism. I mean, it. Um, some people might find it, um, what's the connect? But eventually, I mean, that you're able to contextualize it now and seeing at it in a different way. Thank you, sir, for that. That's very insightful. Of, um, that's very insightful. So... Um, I guess we're now down to, I, I just didn't notice too that um, time is so fast and I guess I'm just down to my for, to my last question. And um, before we end this podcast though, um, I'd like to ask you, Attorney RP, are there any last messages probably or things that you would like to share or impart to our listeners? Um not just about the working group, but also, I guess, um, you as well, your your message for those who are listening to us today? Yes. Uh, I think I would like to impart three things. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, I'd like to impart the continuous curiosity of mm-hmm. people. So when I say curiosity, uh, we must always put a lot of questions, tough and mm-hmm. difficult questions. Yeah. Because again, uh, that's how we grow our minds. That's how we learn. Second, aside from curiosity, is we must be able to um, take a stand. Mm-hmm. Because again, yeah. um, at times, we do take a stand, but simply because we are not curious we don't see the bigger picture, uh, we take a stand for the wrong things. But at the same time, there are times when we are curious. We know what to do. Mm-hmm. But we don't want to take a stand. We are afraid. Mm-hmm. So we yeah. are not able to yeah. chart uh, what we want to do. Okay? And the third one is we need to collaborate and cooperate. So when mm. you say collaborate and cooperate, I like that. Collaborate and cooperate. It also means that, uh, you know, we can't do it alone. Yeah. We need to help each other, and by doing this again, when you were asking, uh, what are our goals for this podcast series? Uh, we want to amplify a lot of voices. We want mm. people to be curious, mm-hmm. people to be taking stands on issues. Not to be mm-hmm. fence sitters, but you know, to be involved. And at the same time, we want people to have the opportunity to help each other 
to cooperation and collaboration. Because by helping each other, uh, we are able to do things and make yeah. and accomplish things. So yes. we can help our respective uh, governments for programs that are aligned with what we see. We can help communities to be able to rise up and be able to demand what they are entitled to, uh, even within families, for example. Yes, yes. We can, uh, we can start with their small groups. Quest, yes, we can uh, you know, start the discussion, take stance yeah. on certain things, and ultimately, uh, for example, elections is uh, always a very good vehicle. Yes, especially in the Philippines now. I mean... Um, um, it's very timely, I guess, since, you know, um, we are going to embark on a new chapter for our country. So that would be very exciting as well. And on that note, we'd like to thank you all for listening to us today. And again, thank you, as Attorney R.P. Santiago, for joining me today in the pilot ep- episode of this uh, beautiful podcast. Join us again next time when we focus on the topic, youth, and what they think the ideal ASEAN looks like. I think this is very ex- interesting since Attorney RP mentioned this topic a while ago and the youth having a voice as well and being empowered to do something, especially these days. So we also would like to encourage everyone to subscribe to the podcast on Spotify so you never miss an episode. And also to subscribe or on to our YouTube channel at info at info ASEAN Mech and visit our website at ASEANHRMech.org. Again, this has been your host, Regine Jessica Buell, for the podcast on the Working Group for an ASEAN Human Rights Mechanism. Thank you again and join us next time. Good night.